time with the data science and machine learning collect, collect in the Google Thailand. And I am too far. Can you turn on the mic? Okay. Uh, I'm too far from Google Developer but on the cloud platform and the city of Equate. So we are an uh, internet company working on online advertising and uh, we have the CPI, CPS and CPI we work with the Lazada, Baidu, VNG and Combo. We have a lot of partners. So uh, the first time we work as an advertising and affiliate company, but then we suddenly we have the data. We, uh, we have the question that how we can monetize the data. So we try to store all the data on the data warehouse and, and find out how to bring more businesses, like the e-doctor, like the dino, that's the, the company that buy on our data. So uh, with the data, we can run the platform for recruiting, social credit scoring, or healthcare. Currently, we run in five countries, and then, and we, are, we have, I think it's like 200 terabyte right now, and with five terabyte neural data every day, come from the telco, come from the, the mobile traffic, the internet traffic, and the social network. And uh, the next big thing we bring to the internet is the uh, uh, credit scoring. You, you may heard about the rep, they build the credit scoring for everyone or every customer if the grab like grab taxi. So that is uh, what we what we bring. Like uh, at the first one, we have the big data and with the data mining algorithm, we can uh, we can build the user identify and with the social user modeling. So with with all the data, we we saw it in the CRM and exposed to the advertising network and, the, and every kind of network and partner. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This is a sample of my my profile. So uh, this profile, my profile is mining from the so only from my social. Is uh, my first and number one. It raises the politics and the social issue. It's only generated from my social. What I uh, what I talking about in the internet. What I uh, what uh, what my check in. What my friend. Who my friend. And and here is uh, what I what I love to do in in my free time. So with the ranking. You, you 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 can see the the star what uh, how 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 much money I have with the star of the hotel of the coffee and uh, with the credit scoring you can you might want to see okay this one well. okay you can see that this is uh, this is a pet you you can you can have all the information of what you want to do if you uh, if you are if you uh, was a bank and you you have a loan application, is it fraud or not? What kind of information? What kind of data you want to do? You want to know to decide the loan application. You can see the age, the, the size, uh, gender, number of day, marriage status, number of subscription number of posts, number of friends, every kind of data may work with your data. And you, you, can, you can mix with the offline data. So uh, with the offline data come from the, some kind of data agency, you can mix together the online data, the offline data to bring the scoring for every customer you want. So uh, this is a, a slide that uh, can you, who familiar with the AI or machine learning? Only few, so I will uh, 
play this uh, video to explain. From detecting skin cancer to sorting cucumbers to detecting escalators in need of repair, machine learning has granted computer systems entirely new abilities. But how does it really work under the hood? Let's walk through a basic example and use it as an excuse to talk about the process of getting answers from your data using machine learning. Welcome to Cloud AI Adventures. My name is Yufang Guo. On this show, we will explore the art, science, and tools of machine learning. Let's pretend that we've been asked to create a system that answers the question of whether a drink is wine or beer. This question answering system that we build it is called a model, and this model is created via a process called training. Machine learning, the goal of training is to create an accurate model that answers our questions correctly most of the time. But in order to train a model, we need to collect data to train them. This is where we will begin. Our data will be collected from glasses of wine and beer. There are many aspects of the drinks that we can collect data on. Everything from the amount of foam to the shape of the glass. But for our purposes, we will just pick two simple ones. The color as a wavelength of light and the alcohol content as a percentage. The hope is that we can split our two types of drinks along these two factors alone. We'll call these our features from now on, color and alcohol. The first step to our process will be to run out to the local grocery store, buy a bunch of different drinks, and uh, get some equipment to do our measurements. A spectrometer for measuring the color and a hydrometer to measure the alcohol content. It appears that our grocery store has an electronics hardware section as well. Once our equipment and, and booths we have it all set up, it's time for our first real step of machine learning, gathering that data. This step is very important because the quality and quantity of data that you gather will directly determine how good your predictive model can be. In this case, the data we collect will be the color and alcohol content of each drink. This will yield us a table of color, alcohol content, and whether it's beer or wine. This will be our training data. So a few hours of measurements later, we've gathered our training data and had a few drinks perhaps. And now it's time for our next step of machine learning, data preparation, where we load our data into a suitable place and prepare for use in our machine learning training. We'll first put all our data together, then randomize the order. We wouldn't want the order of our data to affect how we learn, since that's not part of determining whether a drink is beer or wine. In other words, we want to make a determination of what a drink is, independent of what drink came before or after it in the sequence. This is also a good time to do any pertinent visualizations of your data, helping you see if there's any relevant relationships between different variables, as well as show you if there are any data imbalances. For instance, if we collected way more data points about beer than wine, the model we train will be heavily biased toward guessing that virtually everything that sees is beer, since it would be right most of the time. However, in the real world, the model may see beer and wine in equal amount which would mean that it would be guessing beer wrong half the time. We'll also need to split the data into two parts. The first part, used in training our model, will be the majority of our data set. The second part will be used for evaluating our trained model's performance. We don't want to use the same data that the model was trained on for evaluation, since then it would just be able to memorize the questions, just as you wouldn't want to use the questions from your math homework on a math exam. Sometimes, the data we collect it needs other forms of adjusting and manipulation. Things like deduplication, normalization, error correction, and others. These will all happen at the data preparation step. In our case, we don't have any further data preparation needs, so let's move on forward. The next step in our workflow is choosing a model. There are many models that researchers and data scientists have created over the years. Some are very well suited for image data, others for sequences such as text or music, some for numerical data and others for text-based data. In our case, we have just two features, color and alcohol percentage. We can use a small linear model, which is a fairly simple one that I'll get the job done. Now we move on to what is often considered the bulk of machine learning, the training. In this step, we will use our data to incrementally improve our model's ability to predict whether a given drink is wine or beer. In some ways, this is similar to someone first learning to drive. 
at first. They don't know how any of the pedals, knobs, and switches work, or when they should be pressed or used. However, after lots of practice and correcting for their mistakes, a licensed driver emerges. Moreover, after a year of driving, they become quite adept at driving. The act of driving and reacting to real-world data has adapted their driving abilities, honing their skills. We will do this on a much smaller scale with our drinks. In particular, the formula for a straight line is y equals nx plus b, where x is the input, n is the slope of the line, b is the y-intercept, and y is the value of the line at that position x. The values we have available to us to adjust or train are just n and b, where the n is that slope and b is the y-intercept. There is no other way to affect the position of the line since the only other variables are x, our input, and y, our output. In machine learning, there are many ends, since there may be many features. The collection of these values is usually formed into a matrix that is denoted W for the waste matrix. Similarly for B, we arrange them together, and that's called the biases. The training process involves initializing some random values for W and B, and attempting to predict the outputs of those values. As you might imagine, it does pretty poorly at first. But we can compare our model's predictions with the output that it should have produced and adjust the values in W and B such that we will have more accurate predictions on the next time around. So this process then repeats. Each iteration or cycle of updating the weights and biases is called one training step. So let's look at what that means more concretely for our data set. When we first start the training, it's like we drew a random line through the data. Then, as each step of the train progresses, the line moves step by step, closer to the ideal separation of the line and here. Once training is complete, it's time to see if the model is any good, using evaluation. This is where that data set that we set aside earlier comes into play. The evaluation allows us to test our model against data that has never been used for training. This metric allows us to see how the model might perform against data that has not yet seen. This is meant to be representative of how the model might perform in the real world. A good rule of thumb I use for a training evaluation split is somewhere in the order of 80-20 or 70-30. Much of this depends on the size of the original source data set. If you have a lot of data, perhaps you don't need as big of a fraction for the evaluation data set. Once you've done evaluation, it's possible that you want to see if you can further improve your training in any way. We can do this by tuning some of our parameters. There were a few that we implicitly assumed when we did our training, and now is a good time to go back and test those assumptions, try the values. One example of a parameter in two training set during training, we can actually show the data multiple times. So by doing that, we will potentially lead to higher accuracies. Another parameter is learning rate. This defines how far we shift the line during each step, based on the information from the previous training step. These values all play a role in how accurate our model can become and how long the training takes. For more complex models, initial conditions can play a significant role as well in determining the outcome of training. Differences can be seen depending on whether a model starts off training with values initialized at zeros versus some distribution of values and what that distribution is. As you can see, there are many considerations at this phase of training, and it's important that you define what makes a model good enough for you. Otherwise, we might find ourselves tweaking parameters for a very long time. Now, these parameters are typically referred to as hyperparameters. The adjustment or tuning of these hyperparameters still remains a bit more of an art than in science, and it's an experimental process that heavily depends on the specifics of your data set, model, and training process. Once you're happy with your training and hyperparameters, guided by the evaluation step, it's finally time to use your model to do something useful. Machine learning is using data to answer questions. So prediction, or inference, is that step where we finally get to answer some questions. This is the point of all of this work where the value of machine learning is realized. We can finally use our model to predict whether a given drink is wine or beer, given its color and alcohol percentage. The power of machine learning is that we were able to determine this and how to differentiate between wine and beer using our model rather than using human judgment and manual rules. You can extrapolate the ideas presented today to other problem domains as well, where the same principles apply. Gathering data, preparing that data, choosing a model, training it, and evaluating it.
doing your hyperparameter training, and finally, prediction. If you're looking for more ways to play with training and parameters, check out the TensorFlow Playground. It's a completely browser-based machine learning sandbox. Where you That is a very sad journey. So you, you may want to ask the question, if you and your competitor have the same kind of data, have the same number of data, what is the difference is the productivity of your data scientist? So how do you bring the productivity of your data scientist? So you must have a workflow. You must have a work process. Like, uh, Six years ago, when we have small data and a complex workflow, we have a lot of people to do the manual job, like uh, copy, paste, bring data. We, we, we think very easy way that put the data on in the in the kind of stories that uh, the our employee employee in they feel easily, they feel comfortable with the kind of data source. So they put the, the, my data in the CSV, in the Elasticsearch, in the Mongo, in every kind of data storage they want. So uh, after that, here is our common task. Uh, it tracks the data, of a lot of data warehouse and brings the value. But no one can bring the real value with, when they do a lot of ETL job. That's a problem. So we try to uh, bring the much more process, but nothing works. So we, we try to redesign our flow. Here's the here's the first very first uh, flow of our team. Uh, remember where where I set the data. It's important. Sometimes I forgot the web set the data. And use the tools, extract the data, come from the SQL, Spark, Pandas, Script, everything. Then download the data set. Because of the, some uh, security purpose, I must uh, download the data and, and uh, drop some field and send it to the data science team and uh, with, the, with them for train the model and redeploy. If something wrong, back to step one. That is the problem. Our productivity of data science team very low. Our productivity, uh, the accuracy of our model is low too. So I realized that the machine learning and uh, algorithm is only the small work in the, in the center of this picture. You need the configuration system, you need the data collection, you need the feature extraction, you need process, you need server, you need network, you need infrastructure, monitoring, alert, everything to bring the MVP product with the data mining, with the machine learning to the production to be the competitor. So this is this is this is what that you know that when when you realize that something wrong lead uh, Send, send up and think what's what wrong and what you can do in automatically, not not manually. So uh, at the at the, at the first time, you might, it might slow down your company, slow down your process, but maybe in few months it's much faster. It's much faster, and it's a dry. Don't repeat yourself. Principle. So uh, here is our uh, principle to design the workflow. Simple, don't repeat yourself, single responsibility to scale out and to keep the cost low. If you have the com com complex flow and you, you, don't, you, you cannot split the, the, the module, you cannot uh, 
keep the cost low because you must scale out everything. Here is our uh, flow. So as a, as a first, uh, we have the load balancing and then collect the raw data into the compute engine. And the compute engine uh, converts the, the, the raw file to the packet, packet uh, file and upload to the cloud storage. So our data, uh, that, that phrase, our data science team can use the data lab uh, read data from the data cloud storage and to use the training model, training models, and then uh, redeploy it again. So no one, no one uh, need to have the kind of manual job again. It's the full flow of my company. So the the key of this flow is uh, only one data warehouse. Is uh, we use the cloud storage, only the cloud storage. Yeah, it's uh, expand. So as the first the GCP, the GCP and the cloud storage and data lab and the machine learning engine, you can you can see the list. Yes, I will explain step by step. So why we use this model? Why we use this kind of technology? Why not another? Uh, with the load balancing and the com compute engine. So uh, what I love about the compute engine is the high performance and low cost. With the fast networking, you can see the this feature about the 100 have a network in for in the Google network. So uh, the because Google have the kind of private network, so you have you have your very fast and reliable network in your in uh, when you put your data or your data in a lot of variant like I have two three variant in one in Singapore and one in US West. So uh, another machine can uh, pull the data from the, uh, both the Singapore and the US web uh, to compute the, the data. Then we we convert the raw data to packet because there is a high performance query and and the cell deprobing. You can see it like here is a comparison between the CFV and the JSON. Of course, it much better. Uh, the key of this, uh, the key of performance, the key of everything is the the tie, the how the, the engine saw the data. So it's a column, column that saw, so it's saw in column, not the row. So it can select the what column is one. Like uh, in the SQL, in the SQL, in the RDBMS, if you want to, uh, if you want to select one cell data, you must read to the, sl the row that uh, saw the data. Then it checks the cell. But in the column, uh, you only uh, select the, the row, the, the column that that saw the data only. It's much more smaller, much more faster. Here is, yeah. With the with the row story, you must read to until to the block that saw all the information of the row. But in column, you can select one column. If you want to select add, you get add only. It's much more smaller. Then, then this is 
how we we upload it to the cloud storage because of the it fast it cheap and uh, it has a storage class that you can see here is they have four class that regional multi regional uh, like near, near line and cold line so it's for the fast and for the low data like some kind of data like a kind of data you, you you only need, need the near line or cold line data for backup data but uh, for data for serving for customer every day you need put it into the multi regional or regional data is is it much more expensive a lot but it's fast the key of saving money is choose the know understand the model understand the kind of service and to what we want as a as a company we separate the data into into multiple bucket uh, bucket and then then we saw in the year split in every year then every month so we can select it easily and cheap so with the data lab you can you can write it start, start from the ipython and you can write python code and uh, code and run and and pull the data from the cloud storage and run the run every kind of like um, uh, uh, scikit learn in in zip project it's run in the computer engine too so you can after have get the zero you can share to the work coworker then uh, you can choose the tensorflow or scikit learn to work with the to with the machine learning engine to uh, get the scale level up, uh, scale level of this, then uh, here is two type of maturity, and you have if you want you have your old data you want to use the TensorFlow you want to use the cloud maturity engine, or you want to use the services that uh, like cloud like image like natural language processing, you want to use the, the right side, if you have the other, the, use the left side. Then here's my tip. The first one is create your system principle. It's much more important than coding, than everything else. Then design the system architecture and data flow and data model and data structure first. Then separate the separate the the real time and the bad job, and get the save the cost by network network cost instant cost, sorry cost by read the read the dashboard every day, and get the metric and get the alert when something wrong. A lot of company don't have the data driven culture. That's a problem, and sometimes they. They, they, they ask about uh, why my cost so high it's not high if you if you need if you if you care about your data you talk about your data you run the algorithm but you don't care about the data the platform you run it that's a problem of the high cost so that is thank you Uh, so we're going to 